Hey there, Slashaholics. Before we start tonight, I want to say a big thank you to all the patrons of this channel, because without them, the channel would simply not exist. So, a very big thank you to Jay Gardner, Michael Clark, The Jersey Devil, Jason Epstein, Alex Vanover, Carl of Cthulhu, Chris Dozier, Cinerenic CAX, EXC3LS10R84, Gucci Solo, Iron Alexa, Jackson Smith, Jordan Nicholson, Callie Gamer Girl 82, Catherine McClear, Katie Sabo, Kodo Bukia, Transformers Bishoho, Marshall Jenkins, Morgan Cherney, Nick Valcarve, Peyton Loeb, William Schaefer, Yusuf McRae, Alvaro M., Jacob Hill, Jeremy Wilson, Casey Hawaii, Liam Anderson, Scar, Donovan Shelton, EGSCW, Landon Turner, Mr. D. Authier, Nick, and Serpenthrope. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate you. And if anybody listening would like to help support the channel to keep it going and growing for years to come, please consider joining our Patreon, making a PayPal or Cash App donation, or even ordering a Cameo video. All the information and links to do any of these is in the description and pinned comment below. We can't monetize the channel here on YouTube, so we really depend on Slashaholics like you to keep the channel going. Thank you all so much, and please enjoy tonight's narration of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Chapter 11, First Meeting Vicky didn't believe in fate. She didn't have faith in God or any other higher power. But she did believe in stupid, no good, downright rotten bad luck. Case in point, she had had the bad luck to have been born and raised in Crystal Lake, weirdo capital of the world. Further case in point, she had the atrocious bad luck to have a paternal grandfather that was once infamously known around the county by the charming, colloquial moniker of Crazy Ralph. She'd never actually met the man since he'd met his end at the hands of Camp Blood's vicious Jason Voorhees before she was born. Still, the ghost of the wacko seemed to haunt her every step through childhood and adolescence. She wished she'd had a nickel for every time she'd heard someone call her Nutty Vicky and ask her when she was going to take up her Gramps' holy crusade. I've got to warn you, he would say after he got good and liquored up. You're doomed if you go out to his place. That camp has a death curse. Funny that old crazy Ralph turned out to be partially right. Vicky turned her little compact car onto Cunningham Road, glancing in her rearview mirror at the sleepy form of Stephanie as she dreamed her innocent dreams. She passed by an old dirt road on the left and shivered as her own old ghost story came to mind. There was a small cemetery at the end of that road. She'd seen Ralph's boogeyman walking through the graveyard when she was ten years old. It was a sweltering twilight in the deepest heat of summer. She and Jessica were walking back through the woods after spending the afternoon swimming in the lake. They'd been talking about some silly topic when Vicky's shoe came untied, and she'd stopped at the edge of the cemetery to tie it, while Jessica walked on. She'd finished, stood up, and there he was. He was standing beside a grave marker, as tall as a tree and dark as a cloudy night. He was wearing the hockey mask, red triangles scratched and chipped by years of abuse. He'd stared at her as she stared back, each frozen in that seemingly endless moment. It was funny. Looking back, she didn't remember being frightened by him. It was as if he considered her to be some curious animal, like a kitten or a puppy. He tilted his head to one side and then the other, and then he had turned and strode off into the deepening shadows under the trees. Of course, Jessica hadn't believed her because she hadn't seen the thing. Still, Vicky knew what she'd seen was real. She'd wonder how many other people around the area had similar stories. She pulled off into Joey B's diner and came to a stop beside Ward's rusted-out car. She chuckled at the sight of the pair of pink furry dice that hung from his rearview mirror and the faded bumper sticker which read, Shaggin' Wagon. She got out and carried Stephanie in her car seat around to the front of the building, where Ward, Shelby, and Joey stood talking around the register. Ma, Ward said, I thought the world of Diana. I think you should have closed the diner until the funeral. Joey rolled her eyes at her large son, 
thought about spitting, but didn't want to mar her clean floor. Oh, sure, she said, and give all of you two days off with pay, right? Ward blanched. Come on, Ma. Shelby put a hand on his wife's arm. Hey now, baby, not now. Believe it or not, I'm hurting too, and not just because I lost my best waitress. Vicky sat Stephanie on the counter, frowning at her boss. Best waitress? What am I, chopped liver? Joey looked towards Vicky, a smart-ass comment on her lips that vanished as soon as she saw the baby carrier. What the fuck is that? This is Stephanie, Vicky answered. She's Jessica's baby. Joey seemed to puff up even larger than she usually was, building a head of steam. Fuck that. Get it the fuck out. This is a restaurant, not a fucking daycare. Now come on, pumpkin, Shelby said, unperturbed by Joey's colorful language. He sat on the counter, his short legs dangling in the air, making him look more like a little kid than the older man he was. He slid closer and peered down at Stephanie with a huge grin on her face. I believe that is the sweetest thing God ever put on this earth. You're a little cutie pie. It'll be just as cute on the street, Joey shouted, pointing towards the door. Now get it out! Vicky opened her mouth to protest, but stopped when the phone rang. Joey picked it up. Yeah. Yeah, she's here. No shit. Yeah, I'll call if I see him. What was that about? Vicky asked as Joey hung the phone up. Change of plans, Joey said. The baby can stay. Take her to the back and make her a crib out of some boxes or something. Vicky was taken aback. Wait, what? Joey shooed her with the hem of her apron. Go on, scoot! Vicky went, carrying Stephanie in her carrier, throwing confused glances back over her shoulder. Joey waited until she was gone before turning to the others. What's going on, pumpkin? Shelby asked. Stephen Freeman escaped from the jail. He managed to get his hands on a gun. Oh, Jesus, Shelby breathed. Do they know where he's headed? Knowing Freeman, he's turned, he's turned ass and hightailed it to Canada. But, just in case he didn't, Joey reached beneath the counter and pulled out a large semi-automatic pistol. She pinched the slide and tried to pull it to the rear to seat around in the chamber, but she wasn't strong enough. Here, Shelby said, taking the gun from her. Let me do it. He racked the slide expertly and then ruined the feet by nearly toppling off the counter backwards. Ward caught him at the last second, saving him a nasty fall. Jesus, Pookie, Joey said with a shake of her head. Stephen watched Vicky enter the storeroom from his hiding place behind a pile of boxes. He clutched his taped up broken fingers to his lips, trying to control his breathing. Sure, she could hear the quickened beat of his heart. She placed an empty box onto the table beside the battered old television and then sat the baby inside it. Stephanie looked up at her with big wet eyes beginning to cry. I know this isn't a palace, she said, stuffing some blankets and Stephanie's teddy bear in around her. But it'll have to do. God, you look so much like your daddy. I'll come back and check on you in a little bit, sweetie. She leaned down to kiss the thin wisp of hair on the baby's head and then left. Stephen gasped, realizing he was alone with his child for the first time. He stepped out of hiding and walked over to her. She stopped crying when she caught sight of him. Jesus, he whispered, tears choking him. He ran a finger along her cheek, and she smiled. I don't even know your name. Movement behind him, Stephen turned to see Ward standing in the doorway to the dining area. They studied each other in silence for a moment, and then Ward let the door close behind him. Stephen, what are you doing here? Stephen looked back down at, as if Stephanie was all the explanation he needed. This is the first time I've ever been able to touch my baby. Ward grimaced and then reached into his pants pocket, withdrawing a set of keys and tossing them to Stephen. Take my car. Get out. Ward, I... Ward shook his head to cut Stephen off. Stephen nodded and smiled. Thanks. 
Ward inclined his head toward the back door and then walked back towards the front of the door, shutting the door behind him. Stephen took one last look at his daughter and then tore himself away. There would be time enough for hugs and kisses later, but only if he got moving and found the proof he needed to show Jessica. He ran out into the back parking lot, jumped behind the wheel of Ward's shagging wagon, and hit the road. Chapter 12 What Happened to Robert Stephen drove down the overgrown driveway, cringing as tree limbs scraped swaths of paint from the side of Ward's car. Hell of a way to repay his kindness. Stephen resolved to pay to repaint the vehicle once everything was over. That is, if I live through this, he thought. Foliage parted, revealing a large two-story house with faded brown paint. A set of pollen-clouded windows indicated the presence of a greenhouse or solarium to the left of the main entrance, and a rusted jungle gym sat at the waist-high weeds to the right. As birthplaces of monsters went, the place seemed rather unimposing. Stephen killed the engine and stepped out into the cool afternoon breeze. He took a breath, wrinkled his nose. There was the fam familiar spice of fallen leaves and growing things, but something far more unpleasant lurked underneath. It was the sense of decay. Great. That's just what I need, to be discovered at the Voorhees' house with a bunch of Jason's victims. My life will be over before the brass shell casings hit the ground. No questions asked. Do not pass go. Do not pick up $200. Just go straight to hell and tell them Sheriff Ed Landis sent you. Stephen swallowed hard, trying to squash his rising dread, and walked up to the front door. It was unlocked and squealed open on rusted hinges. Dust mites floated in the air, coated every surface save where it was disturbed by the passage of many feet. Someone had been visiting the place frequently over the past several days. My luck, they'll still be here. He stepped inside and the door shut behind him. He walked down the hallway, past black and white photographs of people long dead. He recognized Pamela Voorhees in a few, though she looked very different in the old newspaper clippings he'd first seen her in. The woman reflected in the framed photos seemed more vibrant somehow. He guessed they must have been taken before Jason drowned, before she went mad. He came to a door that opened onto a large parlor, dominated by a long dining table and sideboard against one wall. A large mirror hung on that wall over the sideboard, its surface shattered by multiple blows. Below this, a strange collection of melted candles and fabric covered the sideboard center. Stephen approached it and paused when he saw the focus of the odd altar. A book sat amongst the detritus staring up at him from a stretched, leathery face. Evidence of crude stitching ran across the cover, bringing together disparate pieces of differing boo that must have been coming from more than one person. Stephen picked the vile thing up and flipped through pages, covered on strange symbols, letters, and drawings. God, the drawings! There was one that showed a person shoving their arms down their own throat and pulling their intestines out through their mouth. There, a woman being skinned alive, another, a man being scalded to death with boiling water. Each image was like a shard of the mirror, driven into his mind. He had to look away, had to throw the disgusting book away from him, but he couldn't seem to make his hands obey him. Instead of closing the book, his hands flipped faster and faster, filling his mind with poison. A rush of fresh air, the creak of wood finally broke the spell and he let the book fall to the floor. Someone was at the front door. Panic flooded through his veins and Stephen sought for anywhere to hide. He saw a door off the parlor, opened it. It was a small closet full of brooms and mops. He stepped inside, shut the door, and felt his heart try to leap from his chest as the floor beneath him gave way. He fell through up to his chest managed to halt his descent with his arms, had to bite back shrieks of pain as his broken fingers struck the floor. Footsteps drew closer. Stephen pushed himself up, and then something was moving in the shadows above him. He looked up and saw Diana's corpse falling towards him from the corner. 
She landed feet first and slid down past him, her cold body rubbing against his as she disappeared into the dark cellar underneath him. Fresh screams rose to his lips and he bit down on his tongue hard enough to draw blood, stifling his cries. The parlor door opened and Stephen found he could see enough through the wide space panels of the closet door to recognize who walked in. Jessica's dickhead boyfriend? What's he doing here? Robert Campbell's phone rang and he answered it. Hey Reggie, what's happening? Oh yeah, I'm there now. I just put the hockey mask and clothes down in the basement. I'm going to dress up tonight and let some people see me. I think a few Jason sightings will really help the story, don't you? What the hell, Stephen thought. What's he up to? Oh, it's great, Campbell continued. He walked over to the sideboard and ran a finger through the carpet of dust on the furniture. It's disgusting. Look, I'm going to want to dress the place up. Maybe we can put a few body parts in the refrigerator. Will, Reg, I don't know. Talk to Harry and Props. You know what we are going for here. Twisted Secrets of the Voorhees House Revealed. Campbell bent down to retrieve the book from where Stephen had dropped it and reverently replaced it near the candles. Oh, Campbell said, grinning wildly. One more thing. Guess what tomorrow's headline is going to read? Body of slain Voorhees woman stolen from morgue. Well, because last night I stole Diana's body and hid it here in the closet. Then I went home and fucked her daughter. Campbell cackled, the laughter and smile very different from those he revealed to the general public. Stephen stared at the man's face through the gap in the door, saw himself climbing free from the hole and charging out. He saw himself becoming the murderer he was accused of being. And we call Jason evil, Stephen thought. Campbell grunted, apparently not thrilled with the response he was getting from the other side of the phone. Reg, do you want to calm down? Listen, it'll all work out great. Trust me. I'll talk Jessica into letting us film here, right? I'll bring the police and they will discover the body on camera. Our ratings will go through the fucking roof. Stephen saw red. He heaved himself up, started to rise from the floor, and then froze as the parlor door burst open and Josh came in. The deputy looked much the worse for wear since the last time Stephen had seen him. There were purple bruises beneath each jaundiced eye and dried blood on his head and chest, evidence of the confrontation at Diana's house the previous night. His skin was ashen and damp with the slimy, viscous fluid clinging to his flesh. The stench of dead fish came off him in waves. Jesus, Campbell shouted. He raised his hands to fend off his attacker, but it was no use. Josh picked the reporter up by the neck and slammed him down onto the table with bone-crushing force. Then Josh was bending over him and clamping his mouth over Campbell's Campbell grunted, gurgled, as if he were choking on some huge object. This is how it happens, Stephen thought. This is how Jason jumps from one person to the next. Campbell kicked frantically, as if in the throes of a grand mal seizure. Went rigid, and then limp. Two seconds of silence, and then Josh stumbled back and looked around in wonder, unsure of where he was. Then the pain began. He screamed as he held his hands in front of his face, screamed as the skin began to run like melting tallow. Blood and pus pattered to the floor like rain. The tips of rounded, soft fingers became claws as the bone beneath protruded through the dissolving flesh. He staggered, fell forward against the closet door, and putrid ooze flowed between the boards to puddle inches from Stephen's face. Oh, Mary, mother of God, Stephen thought. I can't let that shit get on me. I'll go mad. Stephen looked up and saw one clouded eye staring at him through the crack. Josh saw him, recognized him. There was such agony in that gaze, such a cry for help, for an end to unbearable suffering. Stephen could only stare back, soul sick to his very core. Josh pulled away with a bubbly moan, his body parting from the door with a squelch. His hands clutched at his now full shirt, trying to hold himself together as his internal organs uncoiled from his abdomen and puddled between his knees. 
He fell forward onto his face and Stephen heard slackening. Tendons and sinews snap like an overtaxed rubber band. Josh tried to rise, leaving his lower jaw behind on the floor, his tongue hanging limp from his wide gullet. He didn't resemble Josh anymore, didn't resemble anything human. The only thing Stephen could compare the massive, raw, groaning meat to was pictures of horrors he'd seen in the Tales from the Crypt or Vault of Horrors comics as a child. Stephen watched it writhe, its movements growing slow and tired as the body wore down like an old clock. Please, Stephen thought, tears running down his cheeks. Please let it end. Josh was a good man before Jason got to him. He, he didn't deserve this. No one deserved to die like this. One more beat of rotten heart, another, and then the muscle fiber that held the muscle together frayed apart. Josh grew still and moved no more as his corpse went about the business of rapid desiccation. A gasp intake of breath and Robert Campbell, host of American Case File, stiller of bodies and general piece of shit, jumped down from the table. He looked around, a red ribbon of gore running from his mouth to stain his shirt. He turned and stalked out of the room, rejuvenated and ready to complete his task. Stephen heard the front door slam shut. He was alone with the dead. I've got to get out of here. Jason's after Jessica. He pushed, pried, felt jagged splinters of wood dig into his abdomen as he popped free from the floor. He shoved the door open and nearly tripped over Josh's remains on his way from the house. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 11 and 12 of Jason Goes to Hell the Final Friday, a fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Great chapters, Jeremy. You're doing a great job with this book, uh, giving us a little more insight into the characters, what's going on in their minds when they're witnessing all this shit. And honestly, this book is making the body jumping angle a lot more fun. Um, and I can't wait to see what you do with uh, Jason when he comes back at the end. I know in the movie they pretty much had no choice but to uh, make him reappear, you know, the way he looked after the toxic sludge in Part 8, like he did before getting blown up. Um, but I'm, I'm betting you're going to go in a different angle, and I cannot wait to see what that is. Um, it, was, it was cool getting to get into the heads of the crew at the diner. Uh, Ward is really cool tossing him the keys. He understands. He's a chill dude. Seems like Ward would be a fun friend to have growing up, you know? Um... Robert, just a big piece of shit. Uh, loved getting to see him, you know, taken over by Jason. And great description on uh, the Necronomicon, man. That was awesome. We got a lot more of the Necronomicon in the book than we did in the movie. And uh, also great description on uh, Josh, uh, you know, rapidly decaying after Jason leaves his body. Uh, really looking forward to Robert getting shot and all that crap. Uh, curious to see uh, how you handle the part where Jason talks. Uh, that's going to be that's going to be fun to check out too. All right, everybody. I hope you're all enjoying this book as much as me. Please let Jeremy know. Uh, you know, give him a thank you in the comments. He's done a great job writing this book. I cannot wait to get it all put out here on the channel. Uh, if things go the way I hope they do, he just finished writing this, and I just finished writing Celestial Slumber. Uh, I should get both of these books finished at the same time, uh, the narrations of them, and release the unabridged versions pretty, si you know, probably simultaneously. Um, you can also go to the Patreon right now and read the entire ebook of Jason Goes to Hell and the entire ebook of Celestial Slumber, uh, Freddy in Space. Uh, both of those are available on Patreon. No, it's not like we're selling them. It's just early access for patrons. Uh, patrons always get early access to some narrations, uh, all the shows we do. And this is just another form of that. And Celestial Slumber is still in its roughest form, rough draft. Uh, once I get uh, Celestial Slumber finished, uh, Jeremy's helping me format it and polish it, 
I'll release it to the entire internet for everybody in the world to enjoy for free. And I'm sure Jeremy's going to do the same when Jason goes to hell. Um, so yeah, let us know what you thought of tonight's chapters. And uh, we'll be back very soon with more of Jason Goes to Hell. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. We'll see you soon.